Good morning. The committee will come to order. Pursuant to notice, the Committee on Science and Technology uh, uh, is here to consider the following measures. H.R. 5781, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Authorization Act of 2010. But before we get started, I would like to introduce one of our guests. Uh, Mr. Sajazi is the president of the Italian Space Agency here in the front row, and we welcome you here, Mr. Sajazi. <laughs> Italy has been an important partner uh, with us in space and in many other uh, ways, and we look forward to continuing uh, to work with you. And glad you're here to see um, sausage uh, being made uh, right up uh, front. All right, we will now proceed with the markup. Uh, this has been a challenging road to get to today's markup because the issue we are addressing go to the core of what we want from NASA and from our nation's space and aeronautics program. This committee, and in particular the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, under the able leadership of uh, Chairwoman Giffords and Ranking Member Olson, have tried to make the time needed to explain those issues uh, and examine them carefully and to get as much information as we could from the administration about its proposed plans for NASA. As a result, the bill before us today reflects the constructive input of the many witnesses who testified at 19 hearings at the committee and subcommittee level and have held uh, to date on this issue during the 111th Congress. We've also heard from a variety of experts and stakeholders from the government, commercial sector, the science community, the aerospace safety advisory panel and other advisory committees and numerous organizations and individuals. We have benefited from all their views. And let me be clear, the bill before us today is not perfect. I believe that there are a number of amendments that will be offered today that will improve it. That's what the legislative process is all about. However, I think it's a good bill that makes the hard choices that need to be made and we are in a tough economic times and we cannot do it all. <clears throat> well, I believe it is important that NASA remain a multi-mission agency with challenging initiatives in science, aeronautics, and human space flight and exploration. I also want to ensure that NASA's missions are matched to the available resources. As a result, some of the nice-to-haves have had to be deferred and worthy activities have been funded at lower levels than some of us would like. Nevertheless, I think the legislation before us sets a clear, sustainable, and executable path for NASA, especially in the areas of human spaceflight. That <clears throat> has been a part of the dilemma that we have been confronted with. For all of us and for all of its accomplishments, the Constellation program uh, was not executionable as planned, given the budgetary outlook facing the agency. Unfortunately, it has become clear that the administration's proposed human spaceflight program is not executionable under that budgetary outlook either. As a result, we've had to craft an alternative approach that is executionable and that has taken some time, but I believe that the bill before us today provides the nation with a productive future for its human spaceflight program, one that can be sustained even in the midst of a budgetary uncertainty. It is in the interest of time that I will not restate what's in the bill. Instead, I will simply say that this bill represents a balanced, fiscal responsible, and bipartisan approach to authorizing NASA's programs. I want to emphasize the fact that it is a bipartisan bill and that in that regard, I'm gratified that Ranking Member Hall and Ranking Member Olson have joined Chairwoman uh, Giffords and I as original co-sponsor to this legislation. They have made thoughtful and constructive contributions to the bill and I thank them for that. I imagine that there will be amendments before us today on which of the four of us uh, may disagree. But no one should construe that to mean that we are not united on the need for a strong, robust, and innovative space and aeronautics program for the United States. The bipartisan nature of this bill sends an important message to Congress as a whole, as well as to the administration, that NASA is a national resource worthy of our support. Let me just quickly conclude by saying um, that what in all candor, uh, the Constellation program was brought to us by people uh, that, that had a very sincere interest. We found, though, that as it moved along, that it resulted in a balloon mortgage that we could not afford now. Once again, the program that the administration put forth um, was done in all good faith, but once again, we found uh, that that balloon mortgage. We really have to work within our means here. Uh, even looking at the Senate bill, we are afraid that it is not within the, those budgetary guidelines. And I'm afraid that 
the, the passion that we all have on this committee for NASA may not be shared across the board. And as we start getting into tough budgetary times, we really need, I think, to be responsible and coming in uh, with a good budget. And the reason this is so important is that NASA really is, I think, the best brand in the world. It is the statement that the United States is a leader in technology uh, and innovation. And so we have a responsibility on this committee, uh, I think, to nurture it and to move it, it, move it forward. Uh, uh, we all know that we're getting close to election time. We all know that people's trigger finger gets a little bit itchy uh, at that time. Uh, but I have uh, been so impressed uh, with the cooperation on the staff level, on the member level, to try to pull these things together. Folks have parochial interest. I know that there'll be some, you know, some tough issues today that will be very heartfelt, but we're going to, you know, we need to work through these, working together, we're going to come out uh, with the kind of bill that we can all be uh, proud of. And again, I thank you, and I would like to then yield um, uh, to Ms. Giffords uh, as chairwoman uh, of the committee for a brief statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member or Hall. I appreciate this opportunity. Truly, for the members who have been on my subcommittee and in the full committee, this really is at a, is at a point where we're at a crossroads. Um, our job here in this committee is to determine the future of America's spaceflight program, and our job is to determine whether or not America will continue to have a human spaceflight program, second to none, or not. We will determine whether America will continue to push the forefront of space science and technology or not. We will determine whether America will continue to foster innovation and drive our 21st century economy or not. And today we'll determine whether America will continue to inspire the youth of America or not. Of course, we didn't arrive at this crossroads suddenly. Over the last year and a half, my subcommittee held 15 oversight hearings on NASA, exploring these and the many issues facing today's spaceflight program. And over the last year and a half, we've had to face an unsettling reality. After the Augustine Committee made clear our exploration program of record was unexecutable under the current budget. So in response to this report, the President introduced his 2011 budget, which included a number of serious changes to NASA programs. We then had four hearings with witnesses from NASA as well as outside experts to delve into these proposals and to the effects on our spaceflight program. Unfortunately, many of our questions remained unanswered. So the leadership of the committee twice reached out to NASA to get a better justification of the President's proposals, and twice we were rebuffed. Even to this day, we've yet to receive a budget that reflects the changes to the new plan that the President announced on April 15th. Our hope is in the future that we'll be able to work closely with the administration and with NASA to make sure that we have the information so we could move forward um, in, in a closer manner. So when we set out our task to determine the future of America's spaceflight program, our goal was paramount in our minds to develop a sustainable program that will guarantee America's access to lower Earth's orbit, but more importantly, a path to explore beyond LEO, something that we have not done for 37 years. And the result is a bill that provides a pragmatic path forward and gives NASA a clear sense of purpose and a direction in a way that will recognize these, the nation's need for fiscal restraint. And I've said many times before, the President's request contained a lot of good proposals, which this bill, in fact, has retained. And Mr. Chairman, of course, I know you'll get into this, but our legislation authorizes NASA's programs and activities for five years, with total annual funding of $19 billion in fiscal year 2011, rising modestly to $20.99 billion in fiscal year 2015. It extends through at least 2020 the life of the International Space Station, a premier laboratory that should be considered a modern wonder of the universe. And it continues and, in fact, expands our commitment to science and aeronautics. However, our approach differs from the President's proposal on a number of levels, most notably on the development of human spaceflight programs. And the bill directs the NASA Administrator to restructure the current exploration program to develop and demonstrate a governmentally owned crew transportation system to provide assured access to LEO as well as heavy lift transportation systems to provide the backbone for exploration missions. Um, as we've often stated, our role in Congress is not to pick winners and losers. We're not trying to design a rocket in this committee. We know that the best and brightest minds in the country are in the NASA centers around the country, and they should be designing the architecture. So this bill requires NASA to bring those minds to bear on this issue. NASA will tell us in the following months how they'll fly to ISS by 2016 in a crew vessel evolvable to one day explore the solar system. NASA will tell us how they'll build a heavy lift vehicle that will begin flying by the end of this decade and prepare us to once again leave LEO. 
The restructured exploration program will ensure that America will continue to play a leadership role in human space flight and exploration in spite of challenging economic times. The bill also recognizes the value of encouraging the growth of a healthy, self-sustaining U.S. commercial space sector by providing the nascent commercial crew industry with access to NASA technologies and facilities and assistance in the forms of loan and loan guarantees. Additionally, this bill reinforces that NASA will turn over crew transportation to commercial providers when they have proven that they can accomplish the task successfully. The prize is out there. It's up for the American entrepreneurs to seize it. This bill also contains another of great pieces I know that we're going to get into a little bit later today, but I want to again thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know that you've worked very hard with Ranking Member Hall and Congressman Olson as well, and so many members of this committee who are directly involved uh, with NASA's human spaceflight programs and NASA centers around the country, or have constituents that are really interested in human spaceflight. The fact is that, as you said, Mr. Chairman, the clock is ticking. We don't have a lot of time, and this is our opportunity for this committee to put its best foot forward. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Giffords, and for the work you and Mr. Olson did in the many hearings that you had. And I now yield to Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I thank you. I think I thank you for s scheduling this morning's markup. Uh, I sit here thinking about the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take of first, do no harm. And from the devastation we all felt when the president ran a line through the word constellation, uh, that's been our goal and my goal. And I'm on this bill as a co-sponsor in an effort to do less harm than I think the bill across the hall is going to do. But we need to get the best of both and, and work together and try to, try to work this thing through because a lot, of, a lot depends on our actions here. And, and uh, I, I want to begin by commending your leadership and that of your subcommittee, uh, Chairwoman Gabriel Giffords and Ranking Subcommittee Member Pete Olson with excellent oversight hearings conducted during this Congress on NASA's management and execution of its programs. We heard from an impressive array of industry, government, and academic witnesses. And I want to especially note the compelling testimony we heard from former astronauts Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan, and Tom Stafford. These extraordinary men bring a lifetime of experience and a wisdom to the debate. And I appreciate the time and effort that they took to appear before the committee. The work of the Space Committee and full committee was very aggressive and very thorough and helped all members gain good insight into the agency's science, aeronautics, and human spaceflight programs. The hearings and briefings also revealed that NASA was unable to provide convincing reasoning for its decision to cancel Constellation. In spite of repeated requests by this committee, NASA failed to provide credible schedules, cost estimates, and a coherent rationale as to why it was necessary to wipe away $10 billion in taxpayer investment in Constellation to start anew with an ill-defined plan that risked taxpayers' money on a commercial-only solution. NASA also failed to offer convincing evidence that its proposed $6 billion investment in a commercial crew initiative would have any reasonable chance of succeeding or even that careful thought had been given to the basic assumptions about safety, marketability, liability, indemnification, and intellectual property considerations. Mr. Chairman, the bipartisan bill before us today directs NASA to build on key components of Constellation to ensure a robust human space exploration program. It emphasizes that NASA should rely on our investments in the Ares-1 and Orient launch systems to the maximum extent practical and that work should be phased to begin a gradual buildup of a heavy lift launch vehicle. This bill also, the bill also includes important policy provisions directing NASA to transition low Earth orbit crew uh, ferry flights to the commercial industry when it demonstrates the capability to NASA's satisfaction. Until that day, however, the least risky path to minimize our reliance on the Russians is to continue developing a low Earth orbit launch system such as was envisioned by the Constellation program. This bill before us takes the right approach for NASA's other important missions. It sustains a strong and vibrant space science program, enabling new missions to help scientists better understand the evolution of our solar system and universe. It provides funding for important uh, aeronautics uh, research designed to increase the capability and the capacity of our national airspace system to make aircraft quieter, safer, and more fuel efficient. This bill also fully funds the administration's request for NASA's space technology program. 
This initiative is designed to revitalize NASA's long-term high-risk research and development activities with the goal of enabling a broad set of new capabilities ranging from propulsion systems, materials, sensors, and other technologies. We'll need to extend our reach into the deep space. Mr. Chairman, given that our members received a copy of the text just three days ago, I ask that we continue to work together between now and consideration on the House floor to improve the bill so that all of us can enthusiastically support it. I also want to recognize the hard work done by your staff in crafting this bill and the bipartisan manner by which they've worked with our staff throughout the course of the Congress, with special uh, kudos extended to Dick Oberman. He's been very open with us, and he's we're appreciative of all of his efforts. I also want to thank Ken Munro and Ed Fetterman on my staff for their excellent work and guidance through this process. Uh, given the budget constraints as well as the turmoil surrounding the direction of our human space flight program, it's vitally important that this good piece of legislation be enacted as soon as possible. I support this bill. I urge all members to lend their support to it as well. And I thank the other members of my staff who have worked day and night to help me. It's important that we get this legislation through Congress, get a bill, and get it to the president. And at that time, this time, Mr. Chairman, I yield what time I have left and what time he has to consume to uh, Subcommittee Chairman uh, Pete Olson. Well, I want to thank my great friend and fellow Texan, Mr. Hall, for yielding me a little time. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Authorization Act of 2010. We promised a NASA authorization bill this year, and I'm proud to say we're delivering on that promise here today in committee. I want to extend a very special thanks to our chairman, Mr. Gordon, and our ranking member, Mr. Hall, as well as the distinguished chairwoman of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, Ms. Giffords, along with the very dedicated and hardworking staff at the full committee. This authorization bill is very important to me personally. It's also important to the district I represent, Houston, Texas. But above all else, this authorization bill is important to our nation. And so I thank my colleagues again for bringing this to the committee and for exhibiting that in the spirit of doing what's right for America, bipartisan solutions exist in Washington, D.C. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Additional opening statements will be placed in the record at this time. I think we have something like 30-something amendments, so I believe everybody's going to have a chance to, uh, to have their say uh, on this bill today. So I ask unanimous consent that the bill uh, be considered as read and open amendments at the point, at, open for amendment at any point, and that members proceed with the amendments in the order of the roster. Without objection, so ordered. The first amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmas. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an, amend an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 039, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I and many of my colleagues here in the room have always maintained that a NASA-led vehicle is essential in order for us to maintain, I would say, our U.S. leadership and perhaps supremacy in space. And this bill strongly supports that premise. However, I think it's important that we consider other aspects. The development of commercial crew and cargo is an important component to our ensuring domestic access to the space station and to continuing to preserve our unique workforce through commercial and public-private partnerships that spur job creation. The level of commercial investment can be debated, whether it's Augustine's recommendation of $4.5 billion, the President's request of $6 billion, or the committee's level of less than a billion. However, we do know that the Senate authorizers and the appropriators have both now approved a level of funding that will help to develop this essential service. This amendment proposes to match the levels already approved by Senate authorizers and appropriators and to continue the develop me development method, which is currently in place for the commercial industry, uh, based on meeting milestone requirements. 
In addition, my amendment would pr replace provisions in the bill with language from the bill that I introduced in March with Senator Hutchison, which was adopted in the Senate Compromise Bill. This language would ensure that before allowing NASA to procure commercial crew services, we require that the agency meet a number of requirements, including human rating requirements, commercial market assessments, procurement system reviews, evaluation of government supplied capabilities, and infrastructure, flight demonstration, and readiness requirements, and commercial crew rescue capabilities. With these criteria in place, we recognize that public-private commercial space holds promise for the Space Coast and many other communities across the country. We must provide a level of support that will encourage the development of this job-creating industry. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. Would anybody like to be heard on this amendment? I'd like to be heard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm I rise in opposition to the gentlelady's amendment. Her amendment would take roughly $2 billion out of the exploration program and redirect it to the commercial crew account. It also zero out the loan and loan guarantee provisions in the bill. Uh, for the last several years, we've, we've heard witnesses and expert panels complain about NASA being starved for funds needed to build an assured launch system. And now it, says, it now stands once the shuttle's retired, we'll be relying on the Russians for at least four years to get astronauts to and from the space station. Stripping away $2 billion to invest in a commercial cruise system is not the answer. NASA is being tasked in this bill to get us a low-Earth orbit launch system as soon as is practicable. We're also directing NASA to begin design and development of a heavy lift launch system in a carefully planned concurrent approach. $2 billion will delay our ability to get a new system into place. Further investing $2 billion with the commercial provider may or may not be sufficient. No engineering and market studies have been done that conclusively demonstrate the viability of a commercial space tourist uh, market. We've been working hard to direct all the funds we can to get the U.S. back into space. Expert witnesses have told us that the fastest, least risky, and most assured path is to build a government system. Uh, let's not start down the same path, draining funds from NASA's best hope of assured launch. Uh, we oppose this amendment. Ms. Guilford is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, like I said in my opening statements, we have some real issues being able to understand um, the development of the commercial systems that have been proposed by the administration. And I think that comes over into the, um, you know, the, the amendment here. Um, the Aerospace Corporation's own analysis raised some serious questions about the credibility of the administration's funding plan for commercial crew development. And my concern is that this amendment would make some significant cuts to the restructured exploration program, ultimately weakening, weakening its viability. And um, I, I respectfully would oppose this amendment because we've crafted a, a pretty important balance for the funding of this bill, and this amendment would disrupt that balance. Is there further discussion? Oh, Mr. Robacher is recognized. Yes, I uh, move to strike the last words, or I guess that's what we need to say here, but I move to uh, support the gentlelady's uh, amendment. Let's uh, just take a look at what we're deciding here. I mean, you know, basically, uh, the gentlelady's deciding to give at least, let's give commercial space a chance Without her amendment, what we're saying is we're going to put all of our eggs in the government-run uh, space transportation basket. Uh, uh, we need to make sure that there is at least an alternative to having everybody who provides space transportation being a government employee and cutting out these, the entrepreneurial uh, and commercial sector. The lady wants to at least give that a chance. Now, I have uh, two amendments uh, later on that actually go a lot further, and obviously if... Uh, uh, the lady's uh, amendment passes, I will be withdrawing my amendment, or passes or fails, I'll probably be withdrawing my amendment, because uh, if, if, uh, we, what she's proposing is a, is a compromise position that permits us to move forward with commercial and doesn't just sort of cut the legs out from under uh, those people in the commercial sector that would like to build an industry uh, somewhat like perhaps the industry of the airline industry. We have breached a threshold. We're going to have to make a decision. 
Is space transportation going to be something that is nothing more than a government enterprise run by, paid for by the taxpayers and run by government employees? Or do we believe that the airline industry in the United States was a good idea when we reached the threshold that the private sector could provide transportation uh, to the public on jets and other type of vehicles? Uh, it's time for us to at least give the commercial enterprise a chance, and I uh, would hope that all of us uh, would, would support this position because it's a compromised position. What she's talking about is, is, is not just fully accepting what the President had in mind, but let me just note, Mr. Chairman, one of the reasons why there's some confusion here, we haven't had the hearings on this that we need to have, and I'm, I'm, I've worked well with you and uh, uh, with the Democrat majority, but let's face it, we haven't had one hearing that went to this idea, which is uh, which the gentlelady is actually amending, that would uh, 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 talk about the loan guarantee program. Now, where's loan guarantees? Uh, where does that fit in? How come we haven't had any hearings on that? Do we know the loan guarantees are going to work better than what the what the uh, program now is designed for in terms of working with the, the development of commercial space alternatives? We don't know that. So uh, I think the gentlelady's uh, amendment is a, is a compromise, it's responsible, and uh, people on both sides of this issue, whether it should just be a government-run enterprise or whether we should get the private sector involved, should be supporting this as a compromise position. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. I would ask Mr. Olson or Ms. Giffords to correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that you did have hearings and there were witnesses from the commercial space uh, industry and that, that uh, these things were discussed. On the loan guarantee issue, Mr. Chairman? No. Not, not on the loan guarantee itself, that's right. but rather on the... Well, um, that's an integral part okay. of what we're talking about here. Well, let me, let me say that um, I am philosophically in tune with Ms. Cosmas and, and Mr. Robacher, but I am not fiscally um, attuned uh, to that. I would like to see us have alternatives. Uh, I think that we have left the options within this bill and other areas for a commercial um, uh, option, which I, I hope that can move forward. But this is this comes with a $2.3 billion price tag, and it's going to slow down, as Mr. Uh, Hall pointed out, uh, other programs. So, uh, again, as I say, I'm, fis I'm, uh, I'm philosophically but not fiscally um, attuned to this, and for that reason, uh, we'll have to oppose the amendment. Are there any other, anyone else would like to be heard? If not, uh, if there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. 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 The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is the amendment offered by the gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Sensenbender, are you ready to proceed with the I amendment? I am, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 040, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain the amendment. Mr. Chairman, uh, this amendment is kind of a truth and statistics and truth and data amendment. Uh, what it does is it refers to the overlap between the climate data at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom and the climate data that NASA has uh, assembled. Uh, Climategate has been uh, uh, something that has been discussed extensively in the global warming climate change community since the November 19, 2009 release of more than 1,000 emails and 2,000 documents from client and scientists associated with the Climate Research Institute at the University of East Anglia. It revealed a pattern of suppression, manipulation, and obstruction that pushed climate science toward predetermined outcomes in order to promote hysteria and, in my opinion, justify a heavy-handed regulatory response. The scandal was not confined to one British university as it is widely acknowledged that there is substantial overlap between the CRU's temperature records and the temperature records at NASA. Therefore, if the Climate Research Unit's records are suspect, NASA's might very well be true. This amendment isn't about whether climate change is real. 
It's about the integrity of the scientific process and the scientific records that we use to set life-altering policies. This amendment would require NASA to investigate and report to Congress on the degree to which its temperature records overlap with the CRUs and the potential that those records may be flawed. As we continue with the debate on climate science, I think it is important that we clear the air on whether NASA's records ended up being polluted as a result of the scandal that arose in England. And all I am asking for is a report to Congress about whether the records were intermingled and the potential that the records may be flawed. And that way, when we deal with this issue in the next Congress, I think we can have more confidence in the records that are set before us. So that way, I urge the adoption of this amendment. All it does is require a report to Congress, which is a report that I think is necessary, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. Would anyone like to, uh, uh, Dr. Baird is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as my colleagues know, I'm often uh, uh, consistently a, a strong advocate for openness in data, and uh, uh, and have read uh, many of the reports on this over since the issue first emerged. The, I have two concerns. First of all, uh, I find that the scrutiny of of data, uh, if we're going to be open about analyzing data, we need to be critical of data sets. We need to be equally critical on both sides, at the very least. I note that the, my colleagues in the majority have previously heard from a, a putative scientist who claims to have been awarded a Nobel Prize, and he had no such thing, and there's very little uh, scrutiny that comes from the other side on that. But on the matter at hand, uh, the, question, the problem I have with the particular language, and I'd, I'd ask the author of the amendment if he'd willing, be willing to consider this, there is a somewhat conclusory statement that I'm not comfortable putting into this legislation, and the conclusory statement begins on line three. The integrity of the CRU's data set was compromised by the ClimateGate email scandal. That's not an open objective request for information. That's a conclusory statement about the integrity of a data set. And, and Will the gentleman is, yield? I'd be happy to. Will the gentleman support this amendment if we strike uh, the word the in lines three and all of lines four and five? Uh, that eliminates yeah, what I would be. I personally would be. I can't speak for my colleagues on that. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be thus modified. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I appreciate the gentleman's willingness to do that, I, uh, but I, I want to underscore this point. I think we need to look at this, but I would hope that we, we show equal scrutiny to the uh, so-called skeptics of uh, climate change research. We've got abundant data. Uh, I believe on ocean acidification, global overheating, uh, that suggests there, that the, uh, the bulk of the data is solid, the phenomenon is real, and we need to take action. But I think actually adding uh, a level of analysis of the data may help put this uh, uh, issue to bed and we can get back to uh, the true uh, 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 overall findings. And with that, I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank the gentleman for uh, removal of that uh, passage of concern. Mr. Hall is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I, I support uh, uh, the gentleman's amendment, and uh, I support all sound science on climate change. Uh, this amendment's in line with the resolution that I in introduced and we passed sometime last year. Uh, we I introduced it and we debated. I'm just told it didn't pass. Uh, they didn't see the good judgment in it, I guess. Uh, use of sound science in the climate debate, but. That's what the gentleman is, is suggesting here, and I certainly support that amendment and any other amendment along that line. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Ms. Woolsey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, climate change clearly is one of the most serious threats that our nation and our planet is facing. Uh, uh, and Mr. Sensenbrenner's uh, amendment would instruct NASA to conduct a report that it is already written. Uh, I, I really worry that, uh, and would speculate, this amendment might be mischievous in its motives, uh, hoping to create a paper trail among NASA scientists that all outside critics can get through FOIA and use selectively, like the CRU emails, to further inflame passion on climate science. Uh, 
I fear this would only further the burden already harassing NASA climate scientists. I, I oppose uh, this amendment. Uh, I see it as uh, putting a burden on NASA that's already transparent on its data and its methods. Uh, so um, I just think we're going nowhere with this but backwards. Uh, we ought to be going forward. We can't continue to slow down uh, what we need to be dealing with uh, right now, and that's uh, climate uh, change and the, res the effects of what it's having on our planet. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Woolsey. Anyone else like to, Ms. Uh, Ms. I'm sorry. Argument number Mr. Robacher. Argument is. number three, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> without. Uh, all right, that's all right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, let me just note that I remember the hearings that we had here in which uh, investigated whether or not uh, Mr. Hansen uh, from NASA, who is the guru of global warming for NASA, uh, had been censored or in some way uh, restricted. Uh, in, in, a, in an objectionable way uh, when the last administration required that he put at the bottom of his papers uh, that had not been approved by, other, by, by NASA as a whole, that this was his opinion. Uh, and that was it, that same, just requiring a, uh, uh, that type of disclaimer that, uh, that the, all of NASA did not endorse his findings. Uh, we had a hearing to determine whether that was an act of, uh, of, of censorship or if that was an act of, uh, that undermined uh, uh, the honesty of scientific research. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, okay, we, we heard that. We heard the hearing and uh, heard what, what the charges were. That charge was nothing as compared to what we've seen from uh, about this this whole crisis uh, on information from East Anglia and the re and the American researchers that have been tied in uh, to global warming and the indication uh, that uh, through these intercepted emails that there's been dramatic fraud that has taken place. There's been the suppression of information by these very same people. And we have not had one hearing on that that I remember. Has the Science Committee had a hearing on this? We, have, we didn't have a hearing on, on whether or not there should be a loan guarantee that we're now relying upon. Uh, uh, and now we're not, we didn't have a hearing on, on this as well. Mr. Chairman, these are very significant issues. And uh, uh, to the degree that we paid any attention to Mr. Hansen's complaint that he was uh, that he was required to have a disclaimer at the bottom of his documents as compared to the information that we have now about the wholesale uh, doctoring of information uh, by, research, by global warming researchers, people who are operating with government funds, uh, this is a disgrace. We should, we're not doing our job here if we haven't had a hearing on this, and we haven't. And uh, that's why I think Mr. Sensenbrenner needs to have this passed in order to emphasize that this is a, is a major issue that should not just be shrug our shoulders and say, well, we're going to move on now, even though there hasn't been any real investigation of the issue. So uh, I would support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. I recognize myself. Um, uh, Mr. Hall has volunteered to give you a hearing next year, if, um, if that all things work out. Um, <laughs> Let me, uh, let, let me, just for the record, let me say this. NASA already makes all of its data and modeling available to the public. Anyone can go look at it via the internet. NASA scientists already have a 37-page article that goes into careful detail about how they model climate data and, dis and discusses differences with the CRU. That article is in a draft form and out for peer review, but it is available to anyone to read on the NASA website. Now, with that said, um, uh, we have over 30 amendments today that, that deal with the core of NASA. Uh, we could talk a great deal about climate change. I think this is it's important, but a little off message here. And uh, I think that uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Baird has made a, a, a worthwhile suggestion to Mr. Sensenbrenner, uh, who in his normal jovial way uh, accepted. And so um, 
uh, I think that we should take this rare moment and celebrate it and, um, and, and support uh, the modified Central Center Amendment. Is there further discussion? Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, I did recognize that you invited me not to speak. Um, the Oversight Subcommittee would gladly have held a hearing uh, had any of this been within the United States. Uh, this is in East Anglia, which is beyond the subpoena power of our subcommittee. We cannot require documents to be produced from East Anglia. We cannot require witnesses to attend hearings and give testimony from East Anglia. Uh, but we have all seen in the last few days uh, just what selective editing can do to the truth, how badly it could mangle it. If there, if there had not been a complete videotape of Shirley Sherrod's complete uh, uh, speech to the NAACP in Georgia, she would have been forever tarred, her, assassin her, her character forever, uh, her reputation forever ruined uh, as a racist when in fact she was telling a story of racial reconciliation that I can tell you as a southerner uh, has happened on both sides by whites and by African Americans over the last generation or two. What happened with respect to the, to the uh, emails in East Anglia is that a group of emails that were intended to be private, that were unguarded, uh, were stolen and selectively edited. And we have no idea what, what the total picture looked like. And it is beyond our subpoena power to find out. But there have been three inquiries in in the United Kingdom, uh, which is not exactly a developing uh, a third world country. Uh, our sister committee, the equivalent committee of this one, the Science and Technology Committee of the House of Commons, uh, did a full investigation and, and concluded that all of the findings of the CRU are credible, uh, that there was no subversion of the peer review process and that there was no reason to doubt any of the findings of the CRU with respect to climate change. There was a second panel uh, by the Royal Society, which is the equivalent of our National Academy of Sciences, um, uh, chaired by Lord Oxborough, uh, which reached the same conclusion. There was no evidence of any deliberate scientific uh, malpractice or misrepresentation that the findings of the CRU with respect to climate change were credible. Uh, and the University of East Anglia itself conducted a review of all of the information, all of the emails, all of what was done by that, uh, by that unit, by that research unit, um, and concluded that the CRU had not in fact blocked access to any raw data or tampered with it in any way. They had not manipulated data to, to achieve a certain outcome. Uh, there, there was no reason to think that the work of the CRU could not be relied upon, or was unreliable, that it was that could be trusted. Uh, and that, that any uncertainties with respect to the CRU's uh, work were probably applicable to any scientist doing any kind of research anywhere. Uh, so uh, it, it does help this amendment substantially that it takes out a finding that for which there is no evidence, no credible evidence. Uh, I still think that uh, I, I understand that, that the committee will support this amendment, uh, but it is redundant. It is better that it's uh, just redundant rather than factually incorrect and redundant, uh, but it is still redundant because NASA is already doing this and doing it in a very public way. And NASA's, and, and believe me, I'm very critical of NASA. I'm completely willing to be critical of NASA, uh, as everyone on this committee knows. Uh, but with respect to their climate data, uh, it has been open. It has been transparent. It is on the Internet. You can see it. Uh, you can subject it. Uh, it is subject to peer review. I Thank you, Mr. Miller, for that clarification. Mr. There's Chairman. no further discussion. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, we go to this side, uh, uh, Dr. Bartlett. Uh, I'd just like to note that Mr. Miller may indeed be right, but still there is a, there are a very large number of people out there who have some concerns about the credibility of these data. This amendment certainly does no harm. All we're doing is asking NASA to make sure, to make sure of the validity of this data. I can't see any any downside to, to voting this, uh, uh, approving this amendment. I see a large upside in that it, that will confirm to those who, who believe that the data is, is, is not adulterated, that it in fact is not adulterated. How can there be a downside to this? I yield back. If there's no further questions or, or uh, Mr. discussion. Chairman? 
Let's see, I, I believe Mrs. Um, Woolsey has spoken earlier, but I think probably Ms. Johnson we would yield like to, to yield to you. Yes, I will. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I would just, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, some of us would like to consider our vote on this, so could we have a vote? Could we roll the vote? You want a roll call vote? Yes. Could we have yeah. a show of hands vote since there's a lot of folks that would have to come in for that? Oh, we're not going to have any roll call votes on well, anything? Well, we, we may. I mean, if, if later. We'll, we'll have a roll call vote end. anytime anybody wants to. Oh, I'm not calling for it now. I'm calling for it when you, I'm suggesting we're rolling the votes. I, that's what no, I'm oh, no, we're going to take the, we're going to take the amendments as we. Oh, as then I'll, order. no, 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 thank we you. We can have a, we. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I will lose on that one, so no. <laughs> I, no use throwing myself on the, my sword on that one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there's no further discussion on the amendment, then, um, then um, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. And no's noted. Uh, but the ayes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Agreed to, excuse me, agreed to. All right, the third of 30-something uh, amendments um, is uh, on the roster is offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Robacher. Are you ready to proceed? Uh, considering, the, uh, considering the vote that prior to this vote, uh, I will withdraw my amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Robacher. Um, uh, the next amendment on the roster is also an amendment by Mr. Robacher from California. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, this is uh, a bit different because it... Uh, uh, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 046, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Rohrbacher of California. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, there is a difference between what uh, NASA proposed and what uh, uh, the bill before us proposes in terms of spending for uh, the development of commercial cargo, and uh, uh, again, I know that uh, this may scientifically prove that there are snowballs in hell, but I am supporting the administration's request uh, and a champion of uh, President Obama's policy on uh, <laughs> development of, uh, uh, of commercial cargo alternatives. and. Uh, I think that uh, what we, uh, again, what we've done um, in our efforts is uh, an alternative to what NASA uh, is officially requesting. Uh, and if we have, uh, you know, if we're going to this loan guarantee program, which is, might, might be something I might support in the, uh, after we know more about it, um, I, I think that we should not go in that direction until at least we've had hearings on that and determine the efficacy of that approach. So um, what I am suggesting then is that we uh, go with what, the, uh, what NASA and the President uh, has recommended, which will ensure that at least in the commercial cargo part of, uh, uh, of our space program, uh, if we're not going to, if we're not going to have a robust human space transportation uh, system, uh, 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 human system in the pri for the private sector, at least we could have a private sector uh, system that uh, is robust in terms of providing cargo transportation. Uh, let me note that uh, uh, this uh, uh, proposal uh, is not really. Uh, uh, something that we are destroying, the, the, uh, we're just moving around some money here. The, the, the effort for Constellation and, and, and what your budget has, uh, what we're voting on today, will not give us full funding anyway for what we need in, to accomplish uh, uh, the goal that's been stated here of having a government-run system. Well, at least if we do this, we, this will provide the funds that are necessary to have a private sector alternative to that. And we've seen investment and a great deal of success in Falcon 9, and, and we also have uh, Del the Delta system and the Atlas system available to us, uh, and uh, uh, with some modifications, which this would, uh, uh, would help out, they could actually do more than cargo. They could actually start heading even uh, in the direction of, of human uh, transportation. 
But this amendment is focused on the commercial end. We should have, if we can't have a robust uh, human uh, space flight endeavor for the private sector and let the private sector do that, at least we could make sure the private sector can take care of some of the commercial cargo uh, needs for our space program. And that's what uh, my amendment would do. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Robacher. And I've been informed that President Obama thanks you. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Edwards is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I plan to um, oppose the gentleman's amendment. Under the uh, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Demonstration Project, NASA is helping industry develop and demonstrate cargo space transportation capabilities. $500 million was allocated to the multi-year COTS pro demonstration program, and of that amount, $14 million was to be provided in fiscal year 11. However, the FY11 budget request instead includes $312 million uh, for commercial cargo development efforts. That amount represents an increase in the COTS program of over 62 percent relative to the original COTS funding commitment, which is extraordinary in this uh, time. During the committee's review of NASA's budget request, committee staff asked the reason for the $312 million increase. Here's what NASA said. $288 million would be an augmentation to the current COTS agreements for additional milestones that NASA would like to add to the program to provide additional capabilities or tests. $14 million would be for currently negotiated milestones expected to be completed in fis fiscal year 2011, part of the original $500 million COTS funding commitment. $10 million would be for program operations for the commercial crew and cargo office at Johnson Space Center in fiscal year 2011. NASA also confirmed that neither SpaceX nor Orbital, Orbital, the two COTS program participants, requested the additional funding of $288 million. And both they and NASA say that the increased funding is not required to meet planned demonstration flight milestones. The $14 million, uh, for million dollars for currently negotiated milestones is expected to be completed in fiscal year 2011 and authorized in this bill for fiscal year 2011. We include funding for the commercial office at JSC as part of the $50 million for the commercial activities in the bill. But this environment of tight budgets where we have to make tough choices, the bill chooses not to add significant additional funding to a program that's been progressing satisfactorily since uh, 2006 and doesn't need it to meet its milestones. As I know Mr. Warbacher understands, we can't do it all. And when budgets are tight, some of the nice-to-haves need to be dis deferred in order to use scarce resources for other programs in greater need of, of resources. I urge my colleagues to oppose the amendment. And I'd say to Mr. Warbacher, you know, if I had had my way, we'd probably had zero. Um, in, in this program, and so and the administration came out in one direction. We've struck what I think is an appropriate balance Would in the, the organization. Lady, uh, uh, and with that, question. I yield. Would the gentlelady yield for a question? Yes. Um, the money that we're talking about, this $312 million, if it's not spent for the development of commercial, on a commercial alternative uh, and providing that incentive, uh, where do you think the money will be spent? And if the money is spent where, where it will go, will that provide us anything that will work? Uh, I'm suggesting that the money being spent here will end up providing us with commercial capability, but the money, if the $112 million isn't spent here, will it not just go into a program that even by the current plan will not come to fruition and not provide us any added capability. Well, if I could reclaim my uh, time, we have, a, we have a really balanced program and a balanced uh, budget. I mean, the fact is that um, even the commercial enterprises that are identified here didn't ask for the money. Um, and so it seems to me, as we're trying to figure out ways in which we can create balance throughout uh, the agency and the authorization, and you know, support this sort of emerging development of a commercial space flight uh, uh, cargo capacity um, that this budget and the authorization um, herein, I think, really reflects that and at the same time um, enables uh, NASA to move forward in a way that's responsible. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. I think you made a good point that if, that if we took a, 
a vote with all or none, we would have a very, uh, there are strong feelings both ways, and this was an attempt to try to make that balance. If there's no further discussion, then the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. No. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Grayson, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 081, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, this bill provides for $500 million in government support to companies with no revenue, no profit, virtually no capital, no customers, and no product. This is the epitome of socialism and corporate welfare. I, this amendment has one purpose and one purpose only, to strike the $500 million that we're seeking to give to people who haven't even asked for it so that they can supposedly develop a capability that the government already has. Uh, specifically, uh, this is an amendment that eliminates the subsidy in this bill uh, that provides for these commercial entities to get $500 million. It raises the question of why we are trying in the first place to turn over an existing functioning, well-functioning program that uses government uh, ent entities and government uh, resources to put men in space. And we're trying to turn that over to commercial entities for what? So that we can hand them $500 million? Almost every large NASA contract is a cost reimbursement contract. Presumably, if one of these entities ever does develop the ability to put men in space, NASA will give them a cost reimbursement contract. A cost reimbursement contract pays the contractor a fee and then invites the contractor so to submit invoices for its expenses. It's basically a huge expense account. So any one of these companies that actually does get to the point where they can put men in space will in all likelihood get a cost reimbursement contract from NASA. And then on top of that, we're supposed to be giving them under this bill $500 million in loans. For what? Why are we doing this? I think that this is a terrible waste. I think that it, it, if anybody here is serious at all about the idea that we should be cutting the deficit, this is a good place to start. Why hand $500 million of federal resources to companies that don't need it, haven't asked for it, don't want it, and will provide in all likelihood nothing for it? That's why I propose this amendment. I yield back. Would anyone else like to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Robacher is uh, recognized. Well, again, we're at a real crossroads here, and uh, let me just note, uh, I think America is a better country because we have United Airlines and American Airlines and uh, uh, private companies that actually provide transportation through the air, uh, although 100 years ago, it seemed like that would be a totally impossible dream. Uh, we're on the, you know, we're basically, we reach a threshold now technologically where we can have commercial space endeavors, but all along, as we know, uh, in the development of, of uh, private industries and, and, and taking technologies and taking it in the private sector, and uh, uh, there has, there's never been a, a uh, you might say, a, uh, a pristine free enterprise approach, and there has been some government involvement, and the degree is whether or not some of us believe in some government involvement versus some people don't believe there should be any private sector involvement at all. And uh, I, I respect the notion that the government should run everything. I respect the notion that the businesses that are now run in the private sector, that people should be out there, should be government employees. If people actually believe that that's the best approach to running uh, enterprises, and uh, uh, that's great. I don't agree with that. I don't think the American people agree with that as well. I think the American people are very supportive of efforts to try to get uh, uh, private individuals and entrepreneurs and, and commercial enterprise involved in what has basically been a government-run operation in terms of space transportation. And uh, uh, this, what this bill does is, and again, I would agree with the gentleman one thing, we haven't had the hearings necessary to talk about the efficacy of the, of the loan program. But that doesn't mean that, that we are just basically now going to uh, take the steps of, uh, uh, that would just totally undermine all of the different approaches. 
to commercial space because that's what we're hearing today. We're hearing today that it's not good just to have the grant, a grant program, it's not good to have, and so, and now it's not good to have a loan guarantee program. And what we're really saying here is what we're really hearing here is that their government should run all of the space business in the future. That we're, that's what, that's what, you know, we're making that determination. I would suggest that by taking uh, uh, this money and providing, at least for loan guarantees, I would have had it even uh, uh, more direct than that, uh, that it's a wise use of our money, and, that, and apparently NASA and the administration agreed with that, as compared by putting the same amount of money, this $312 million, uh, into the exploration program uh, that we're going to be building a government system that the money that's being provided won't even guarantee that we have that system. Because, so we're spending, we're taking it from loan guarantee program for commercial enterprise and giving it to part of our budget that will produce probably nothing, no capabilities, because we're underfunded, it's underfunded to the point that we know we're not gonna be able to accomplish our mission with it. So uh, I would suggest that the, uh, 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 the gentleman's uh, uh, amendment, is, uh, I, I, I certainly appreciate people with, with different uh, philosophical approaches to what uh, government should do and what it shouldn't do, but this will be the uh, coffin, the, the nail in the coffin uh, for commercial space if we continue down the path that we seem to be going today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Giffords is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also will respectfully, respectfully oppose the, the gentleman's amendment. And again, we, you know, we've been talking a lot about the balance in this bill and really trying to ensure that we have a, a national human spaceflight program that, that is um, um, NASA-led and that we're also trying to augment and promote the future of commercial space. And the way that, that this provision is written, the administrator is not going to provide loans or any loan going guarantees to, to any companies um, unless among a whole series of conditions are met. And they include the administrator determining that there's a reasonable prospect of repayment of the principal and interest by the borrower, and also that the amount of the obligation when combined with the amounts available to the borrower from other sources is actually sufficient to carry out the total development cost. And finally, that the administrator shall charge fees sufficient to cover the cost of administrating the program. In contrast to the direct funding that the administration takes in their tax, this bill exposes the taxpayer, I believe, to minimum cost and minimum risk, but allows the amount of federal funding allocated for the loan guarantees to potentially leverage a significantly greater amount of money. Um, how much more will be set by OMB? Well, who will have the chance to assess the risk involved with the loan guarantee programs? And since OMB is providing such large amounts to commercial providers in the president's request, I have to assume that they consider the risk to be low, so they should be willing to provide a rate that allows a large amount of leverage from the available funding. But of course, that's for OMB to determine, not for us. Um, also, would, would just like to note that the gentleman's amendment actually cuts into NASA's budget, and I, I don't think that's the intent of, of the committee. Uh, in, in fact, you know, if, if I'd been the president, I would have doubled NASA's budget, frankly. I mean, we, we don't have th that much resources. I want to make sure that we keep all the dollars on the table that we do, that we have. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not to my right, to my left, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief with this. Uh, I support the amendment as proposed. I also note that the guarantee, as written here, would require that the private entrepreneur come up with 25% of the money, and 75% would be the, uh, the federal uh, loan guarantee. I just think that we do have a program. I agree with all that Mr. Grayson said about uh, duplication. We're talking about companies that have really no track record at all of receiving up to half a billion dollars of uh, federal loan guarantee. Perhaps they can pay it back, but uh, we're looking at 75% of the money being the government's share here, and I think we'd just be better off saying no and moving on. Is there further discussion? on this issue. I'm sure there'll be further discussion as we go through <laughs> down the uh, one of the amendments, but in terms of this amendment, if no, I, uh, then um, uh, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no.
No. No. Uh, have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Uh, a recorded vote has been asked. Uh, the clerk will record the vote. Uh, poll the vote. Chairman Gordon. Chairman Gordon votes no. Mr. Costello. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Woolsey. Ms. Woolsey votes no. Mr. Wu. Mr. Baird. Mr. Baird votes no. Mr. Miller. Mr. Lipinski. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Giffords votes no. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge votes no. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes no. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Rothman. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Davis. Mr. Chandler. Mr. Chandler votes no. Mr. Carnahan. Mr. Carnahan votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Dahlkepper. Yes. Ms. Dahlkepper votes aye. Mr. Grayson. Aye. Mr. Grayson votes aye. Ms. Cosmas. No. Ms. Cosmas votes no. Mr. Peters. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes no. Mr. Lamar Smith. Mr. Roy Barker. Mr. Roy Barker votes no. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett votes no. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Ehlers votes no. Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas votes no. Mrs. Biggert. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Inglis. No. Mr. Inglis votes no. Mr. McCall. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Adrian Smith votes no. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown votes aye. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. Mr. Rothman votes no. Mr. Wu votes no. No. Ms. Edwards votes no. Mr. Cha Chairman, I'd like to move from a no to a yes.
Mr. Chairman, six members vote aye and 23 members vote no. The ayes have it. The amendment is not, I mean, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Um, and the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmas. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 040, amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading without objection. So ordered, I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's fair to say that all the uh, discussion around amendments for today's bill uh, focus on our attempts to find a balance in what we're proposing to do. That is to say, we want to ensure that we maintain America's leadership with a NASA-led vehicle, but we are looking for opportunities to uh, increase the use of innovation and, and uh, entrepreneurship. And this amendment proposes to do just that by suggesting we authorize and fund from within the exploration budget a flagship technology demonstration program. This would be based at the jo Johnson Space Center and at the Kennedy Space Center. Demonstration missions would be launched from Kennedy Space Center and utilize the expertise and the workforce there, which has been my number one priority uh, in the 19 months that I've been serving here. The Augustine Commission, as well as many previous commissions and studies, have identified the need to develop these technologies, such as an on-orbit refueling, in-site resource util utilization, life support systems, and new propulsion methods in order to enable human spaceflight below low Earth orbit, beyond low Earth orbit, orbit excuse me, beyond low Earth orbit. Technology such as on-orbit fueling has the potential to significantly improve the performance of heavy lift vehicles while achieving appreciably lower total life cycle costs. The ability to utilize the resources at the destinations we intend to visit is also essential to conducting successful long duration exploration missions. The need to develop and prove these types of technologies is fundamental to the successful execution of an exploration program. My amendment proposes to fund this program at the same levels already approved by the Senate authorizers and appropriators in order to spur the development of these critical technologies. I urge you to support my amendment and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Cosmas. And Mr. Hall is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I oppose this amendment. We've worked very hard to ensure that there's a follow-on program to the sh space uh, shuttle that would assure the U.S. has a vibrant space exploration program. Gentlelady's amendment will likely take money away from the task of developing the next generation of launch vehicles so we can reduce the gap as soon as possible. I think some of her proposed technology demonstrations would be useful, but I don't believe most of us are willing to take money from the development of exploration vehicles to do that at this time. We do oppose the amendment. Is there further discussion? Um, Mr. Robacher is recognized. Um, well, I'm glad to see <clears throat> that there are some people here who are uh, looking to build the future rather than trying to just get by uh, with today's capabilities. And what uh, uh, the, the lady from Florida is suggesting uh, as, a, as a priority for this budget is, some, is, is again, very future-oriented and uh, uh, as uh, compared to simply spending money on a uh, system that uh, will not, uh, well, let's put it this way, it's based on, on, on old, old concepts. She's taking money from, from uh, part of the budget based on old concepts and, taking, uh, and trying to put, the, put that money into developing new technologies in new ways uh, uh, to approach space exploration and space transportation. And it's, uh, I happen to believe, and anyway, we've had to talk about commercial now, I happen to believe commercial is a way to go, but certainly we should be talking about new technologies as the way to go. And one of the big problems with the Constellation program and the Ares system uh, and spending money simply in, in that program was that it was not developing new technology. And the lady is, and the money that's being funded in this bill will not even lead to the completion of that program. So at least what the lady is proposing is that we take money uh, that is being spent in a way that will not lead to the, the completion of any project 
and at least let's uh, start developing these new technologies that will give us new capabilities uh, for uh, better approaches to space uh, transportation. And uh, I would not be supporting it if it, uh, uh, if it just added more money, but I believe this is uh, now we're actually shifting money away from something that is less creative and will give less benefit in the end to, to America than developing these new uh, concepts of uh, space transportation like refueling, which I believe, and I agree with the lady, would uh, will open up a whole new uh, a world or a whole new universe of, of exploration uh, for humankind uh, if we perfect that approach rather than just relying on the old approach, which is just building bigger rockets, bigger behemoths to launch into the air. Well, this will give us a, uh, perhaps the same capability as building some big constellation rocket by uh, putting money into developing a system of refueling and other type of technologies that will expand our capabilities in a new way rather than relying on the old ways of approaching space transportation. So I would uh, ask my colleagues to uh, join me in supporting this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. Let me point out that um, <laughs> this bill does provide $5 billion over the next five years for new technologies. Because we, you know, and I certainly agree with you that we want to look at the, for those new technologies. Um, but I can't agree uh, that this does not add additional expense. It actually adds $2 billion uh, to uh, the program, uh, or it will uh, pretty much gut much of the exploration program, as, as uh, Mr. Hall has pointed out. And so for that, even though I, I, I am sympathetic to it in, you know, in, a, in, a, in a world with additional resources, I'm afraid that we can't afford it now. Is there further discussion? If no further discussion, then the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. no, no, the no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Lujan. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 065, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Lujan of New Mexico. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Again, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The commercial reusable suborbital research program at NASA, known as CRUISER, is designed to allow students, businesses, and researchers to fly experiments on board commercial suborbital space vehicles. The goal of the program is to facilitate access to near space by NASA sponsored researchers, engineers, technologists, and educators. These flights provide researchers access to microgravity environments, which is far less costly than sending experiments into the International Space Station. The President's budget request for NASA includes $15 million a year for the cruiser program for 2011 through 2015. However, the original text of this bill only authorizes $1 million a year for cruiser from the Space Technology Authorization for 2011 and 2012. My amendment would strike the $1 million annual authorization for the cruiser program for 2011 and 2012, removing the $1 million limit and leaving allocation of funding for cruiser to the direction of the NASA Administrator. This is not a new authorization nor does it take away funding from any other authorizations in the bill. My amendment also clarifies management and other requirements of the program, which are consistent with critical suborbital science missions. My home state of New Mexico is currently reaping the economic benefits of commercial suborbital spaceflight through our Spaceport America facility near Las Cruces. About 500 New Mexicans are now on the job, creating the first commercial spaceport in the world. Another 300 new jobs are expected this year. New Mexico's space board is inspiring students to study math and science and pursue careers in STEM fields, which will develop our future economy. Investments in programs like Cruiser and in public-private partnerships within NASA to support and develop a suborbital spaceflight will ensure that America continues to be a global leader in the space technology for the 21st century. With that, Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you for your consideration, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Lujan, for uh, a, uh, another good amendment. Does Mr. Uh, Hall w w wish to be recognized? I do. Oh, uh, I would like to be. Mr. Hall I don't Hall. have to be. <laughs> Mr. Hall is recognized. I, 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 I was going to whisper to you that I support his amendment. Uh, I do plan to support the gentleman's amendment. I have some talented young guys in my hometown of Rockwall, Texas. That, 
It's the smallest county in Texas out of 254 counties. I hate to admit that anything's small, but right there in that small, <laughs> small county that operate out of a little place called Caddo Mills Airport, they have a company called Armadillo Aerospace, and I attended a, a celebration for them and a recognition for them here. Didn't know where I was going, didn't know what I was going to say when I got there, but NASA had a prize program, and they had won a part of the prize program and w received a half a million dollars. And I've seen a video of some of their work. I hope to get out there and see them in person one of these days, but they're doing some very interesting things and have some good ideas for commercial reusable uh, suborbital flight vehicles. I've had some concerns with aspects of the program, but I think Mr. Lujan's amendment has improved the program, and it's likely to get help, and likely to help some of these bright young people make good contributions to the scientific research. I make no, uh, no recommendations for my colleagues. They can vote the way they see fit. They're going to anyway, but for me, I'm going to support Mr. Lujan's amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. I think Mr. Lujan probably thanks you. Um, <laughs> If there's no further discussion on the amendment, uh, oh, Ms. Cosmas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, very quickly, I want to speak in support of this amendment. The suborbital cruiser program obviously provides many opportunities for NASA, university or private researchers, tourists, and other federal agencies. Uh, the thing that I have identified as my number one priority also might be affected here, as these uh, opportunities can use the shuttle landing strip and other facilities at Kennedy Space Center, and therefore uh, my workforce and the expertise that they have may be put to good use through the uh, support of this program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cosmas. Does anyone else wish to be heard? If, if not, then the vote appear, uh, occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from, from Georgia, Dr. Brown. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 001, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was excited to hear you as you uh, made your opening remarks about being fiscally responsible. And I want to thank you, Ranking Member Hall, Chairman, Chairwoman Gifford, and Congressman Olson, along with the staff, for all of y'all's hard work in producing this bipartisan bill that will allow NASA to refocus its core mission in a fiscally responsible way. I know this has not been an easy task and many difficult decisions had to be made. While I believe this bill is a good faith effort towards a balanced approach and addresses the right priorities, I'm still concerned with the heavy burden of debt and the huge deficits looming before us. Therefore, I offer my amendment today that would authorize these programs for three years instead of five years, as the current language does. Again, I appreciate by the strong bipartisan effort in developing this bill, and I urge my colleagues to support my amendment. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Brown. I want to excite you some more in that uh, I support your amendment. Um, but I also hope, uh, and part of that is because I hope in three years, uh, that there will be more money available, that we will have a better economy, and that we will be able to carry out things that Ms. Cosmas, Mr. Mr. Robacher, and other good amendments that have been before us. Mr. Chairman, would you yield? Uh, certainly, Dr. Brown. Uh, I'm excited that you accept my amendment. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to be very quiet over here and let Mr. Robacher talk, but, uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, thank you, and I agree with you, and I associate myself with your last remarks about You're always more a constructive money. part so, of it. Thank you so much, sir. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If no, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am, I, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 003, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, conspicuously absent from this legislation is any mention of the Constellation Program. While well, that might suit the prerogative of the administration, it is not consistent with the intent of this Congress or this committee. 
Congress has repeatedly affirmed its support for the Constellation Program through the previous authorization bills and by the sentiments expressed by members on both sides of the aisle. I'm not here to defend NASA's mismanagement of its resources. Without question, budgetary constraints force us to reevaluate how each program has been managed, but the wholesale elimination of Constellation will have detrimental effects on our struggling economy, set back our space program several years, and result in significant termination costs while surrendering the progress that has been made in recent years. This amendment makes it clear that this committee and this Congress continue to support the Constellation program. Now, what I'm here to say is, is that I'm afraid that the omission of the word constellation in the text of this bill will be interpreted by the administration as saying that we are going back on what we have previously stated in statements and in authorization legislation that has been previously passed. And all this amendment does is to insert the words constellation program and after support for. So this makes it clear that this is not a 180 by the committee. It is not a 180 by the Congress. And what we should be doing here, if we need to redirect and reprogram money, is to do it in the context of legislation uh, that has been around for more than 20 or 48 hours and open for amendment uh, for only 24 hours. Uh, this is a big program. We spent $10 billion dollars on it. And we do need to spend a little bit more time before either withdrawing support for Constellation or allowing the administration to say, well, since Congress didn't mention Constellation uh, as they have in the past, I guess they have drawn back on it. Uh, there's no fiscal effect on this. This basically transfers the burden to NASA to come up here and to be a little bit more detailed on why they're doing this. Uh, uh, given the previous support and previous comments by members of this committee, I would strongly urge members to adopt this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Let me point out that there have been a numerous hearings, I think 19 hearings on this program. Um, this is not the Constellation program that was envisioned uh, some time back, um, simply because we simply do not have the money. And as, as Dr. Brown has pointed out, we're trying to live within our budget. This is, a, this is a new program. And let me also point out, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this committee has never named a, uh, a program. Uh, that's up to NASA. And so I would say that we should continue uh, with that, and it's up to NASA to name the, the name. I'm more interested in the content. This is, this, this is a content that has provided good, uh, a good balance, and I would suggest that we uh, continue and reject the um, the uh, gentleman's amendment. Is there further discussion? If not, yes, I'd, I'd, uh, Mr. Hall recognized. I'd like to yield to Mr. Or, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Sensenbrenner if he wants uh, to say I a think, word. I, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. We're not naming this program. We're using the program that NASA named. Uh, I, I fully agree that NASA has the prerogative to name programs. You know, we shouldn't be of uh, saying that this is the Jim Sensenbrenner program or the Bart Gordon program and making monuments to ourselves, but I'm just referring to NASA's own terminology in this uh, amendment. This is very clear. You know, are we going to go back on the support for this program or are we not? And all this does is insert NASA's name in the list of things that we support. I thank the gentleman for yielding and yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me take up my time if I might. Uh, we do name uh, things after people and after programs. Uh, there's a certain chairman of a science committee that uh, I'm gonna name the Barton ARPA E uh, <laughs> Foundation uh, to, uh, if I live and if I'm here next year. Uh, and I don't think it hurts to address or tip our hat to the word constellation because that's been the battle cry of all of us that to keep keep Constellation, build on it, change whatever changes we had to make on it, but make it a NASA program rather than loaning some bunch of people some money, not knowing if they're going to pay it back, and then they're going to charge the hell out of us for flying in one of the seats, uh, not ever knowing that we'll ever get our money back. We could call it Constellation Light or uh, anything else, but uh, I support the gentleman's amendment. It's a simple amendment that reaffirms Congress' support for the Constellation program. 
Constellation program has been a rallying cry for thousands of aerospace workers and former astronauts. The former astronauts came here, used the word constellation time and again, and uh, Cornyn and uh, Armstrong Stafford. And it means a lot to those old heroes of the past who came here before this committee to, to take on the striking of a line through the word constellation that brought us here, that spawned this hearing. Uh, while this bill makes some important updates to the original Constellation program, it retains the key elements and focus of that vision. And that's what it is. It's a vision. I think it's important that we recognize as a Congress the legacy of this program. I think that the gentleman's amendment does precisely that. I urge the passage of it, and I think you're going to hear from a lot of the old astronauts if we don't put Constellation back at least into this program somewhere. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Let me just sort of conclude. We've got votes going on. Uh, I was a supporter of Constellation, uh, but if we're going to call it Constella Constellation, we need to fund it like Constellation. This program is not being funded like Constellation. But this is, uh, this is when you read the bill, uh, this clearly is a hybrid with a lot of the Constellation uh, investments that's been made, but it's something different. Once again, I think uh, this committee has never uh, named a program. Uh, it's up to NASA. I, I, I think that Mr. Hall has a good idea of changing that precedent next year, and I would welcome him to do that in, in the, in the, the uh, context of what he was talking about. But he, we're here today, and so if there's no further discussion, uh, then um, uh, those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. Uh, I think the well, we're, uh, I, I want to do the right thing here. Let's see. What, 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 let's, have, let's have a show of hands. Let's just. Well, that's one, let's, let's, let's have a show of hands. Uh, if those that are favor say aye. Uh, opposed, raise your hand. The the uh, nose uh, have it, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I demand a recorded vote. You can get it. Um, you're bringing them back. So nice. The clerk will record the vote. Chairman Call Gordon. The... Nope. Chairman Gordon votes no. Mr. Costello. Miss Johnson. Miss Woolsey. No. Miss Woolsey votes no. Mr. Wu. No. Mr. Wu votes no. Mr. Baird. Mr. Barrett votes no. Mr. Miller. Mr. Lipinski. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Giffords votes no. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards votes no. Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge votes no. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes no. Mr. Tonko. No. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Rothman. No. Mr. Rothman votes no. Mr. Matheson. No. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Davis. Mr. Chandler. No. Mr. Chandler votes no. Mr. Carnahan. No. Mr. Carnahan votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Wilson. Mrs. Dahlkepper. Mrs. Dahlkepper votes no. Mr. Grayson. No. Mr. Grayson votes no. Mrs. Cosmas. Ms. Cosmas votes no. Mr. Peters. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes aye. Mr. Lamar Smith. Mr. Roybacher. No. Mr. Roybacher votes no. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett votes aye. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Ehlers votes aye. Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas votes aye. Mrs. Biggert. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Inglis. Mr. Inglis votes aye. Mr. McCall. Mr. McCall votes aye. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Adrian Smith votes aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Brown votes aye. Mr. Olson. Aye. Mr. Olson votes aye. Aye. Mr. Miller votes no. 
Miss Mr. Rapinski votes no. Mr. Chairman, 10 members vote aye and 19 members vote no. As when we come back, we'll proceed with Mr. Olson's amendment. M Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Mr. Ms. Edwards. A, do you have a time that we're, we'll come back? You have a specific time? Well, yeah, okay, let's do this. No, I mean, I'm sure people would like to go to their offices, uh, but uh, I would like to get started 10 minutes after the last vote. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 